Well, um, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this session. Thank you so much for joining me. It's a real privilege to contribute to this event. I can't think of a better title, really, for an event to be held at this time, um, other than transforming education, transforming lives, because I, I really do feel that that is our agenda. That is exactly what it is that we need to be focusing on in this post-COVID period. So um, it's wonderful to be with you. I, I don't know about you, but with all the drawbacks and, and hateful aspects of being locked down and unable to join together in person, being on Zoom conferences is so wonderful to see the, the, the variety, the, the, the truly global nature of these events. So just looking down now, South Africa, Poland, Ireland, Norway, I love it. So um, welcome and thank you for joining me. Um, I'm going to be talking about what I believe to be the fundamental problem in terms of transforming education and transforming lives. And that is that I believe that we need to be rethinking our purpose in education. Someone said to me the other day, purpose is the new black. And I hope they're right. I think we all need to be focusing on our purposes much more sharply and much more thoughtfully than perhaps ever before. And so on the journey towards transforming education and transforming lives, I'm gonna be drawing on a book I published a couple of years back called Thrive. Um, and if I may now share my screen with you, you'll get a sense of that. Um, I called it Schools Reinvented for the Real Challenges We Face. And I chose that subtitle because I think that schools have been, and indeed in some senses, colleges too, a bit detached from the real challenges humanity faces. And my agenda really is to try to connect in a really direct way what schools are doing and the challenges facing us as a planet and as humanity. So that's why I chose that title and that's what I'm gonna talk about this morning. Can I say, I really, really would welcome your questions and your comments. Um, the chat function is obviously there for you to start recording them as you go in terms of being active listeners. But if you'd like to make a, an oral contribution in person when I finished, I hope there will be plenty of time to do that. So schools reinvented for the real challenges we face. And, um, I must start, of course, with COVID because everything is gonna be refracted through the lens of COVID. And I'm sure in terms of yesterday's debate, you started to get into this. But here are some of the things <clears throat> which I think are important to keep in our minds as we hold this debate. The first is that we've learned through all of this that life is not stable and steady state and reliably comfortable. And it's a very important lesson to have learned that we are in precarious circumstances, not to learn that to become anxious and to transfer that anxiety to young people. You know, I do think that for generations born after 1945, most of us, we have come to believe, other than some scares around our nuclear fragility, <clears throat> that life just goes along smoothly and comfortably and of course it does not. If you lived in Syria or Afghan, Afghanistan or um, Yemen, you know that very well. And for the multi-millions of migrants now who are forced from their homes because of the instability of their region, they've learned that. But across much of the global north, we've continued with schools as though life is just as it was in the past, and we don't need to worry too much. COVID-19 was neither unprecedented nor unpredicted. It was not unprecedented because pandemics in the past have thrown societies into chaos and reordered their, their economies. You only need to look at the Black Death and Spanish flu. And nor was it unpredicted. Um, if you look at Bill Gates's TED talk from 2016, he predicted it with incredible levels of specificity and set out some planning proposals, which were largely ignored. 
But there are other really unprecedented shifts, really ones which are both predictable, but utterly unprecedented in humanity's history. I'm gonna talk about two in particular, the planetary emergency and the apotheosis, apotheosis of technology. Technology assuming godlike status. The third piece of learning I think that's important is that futures thinking really matters. We know some stuff about where trends are leading us. And the whole discipline I think of futures thinking, that of anticipation, scenarios use, is going to become much more central. And there may be in the audience today from higher education, some people who are working in the area of futures. And I think their work is going to become more and more important. And of course, the fourth thing to notice after this health crisis will come the economic and the social crises. <clears throat> we are already starting to see the beginnings of those, um, but I fear that we're just in the foothills of what will grow over the coming year. And it's wonderful news, of course, about the vaccine that we've heard in the last 24 hours and two or three others, which are about to announce in the next week. But still, the aftermath of this, in terms of the economic fallout, and therefore the social crisis will be immense. And finally, I want to say that inequality and deprivation both caused greater hurt. In other words, it made you more vulnerable to the virus itself and to the illness. But it is also, there are also outcomes of, of the virus itself. So inequality has grown during this period and will continue to grow as unemployment becomes <clears throat> an even more severe and serious problem. So we can't, I think, set aside what lessons there have been through COVID. But where I want to go next is to think about this issue I raised at the beginning. If education is to help us get out of all of this, we need a new narrative, a new story about what education is for. And I think that that story, that new narrative, <clears throat> has to start with our purpose. I come back to Bill Gates. I'm not a huge Bill Gates fan. It sounds as though I am. I've referred to him twice already, but I was very struck by his blog in 2018 in which he said, <clears throat> our biggest worry is not an attack by rebellious robots, but a lack of purpose. And I believe that to be profoundly true. So I want to argue that our explicit purpose in education particularly, but more generally, is about learning to thrive in a transforming world. So there are two parts to that statement. One, we have to ask ourselves, what do we mean by thriving now? What are our new definitions of success? What is our understanding of what it is to flourish and to thrive on this world of ours in, this is the second part of the equation, a transforming world, a world which is not that which it was like at the beginning of this century. So I'm gonna begin by thinking about the nature of the transforming world, um, here is the book in which I set out this argument in depth. Please don't bother looking for it at the moment because it's sold out and out of print. And we have just completed a second edition, which Cambridge University Press will be bringing out in February of next year. And I do hope that perhaps then you might look at it <coughs> and in greater depth evaluate the strength of the arguments I advance in it. And it starts with what good evidence do we have about the coming 30 years, about the nature of the transformation? And of course, there is a paradox in talking about evidence about the coming 30 years because they haven't happened yet. So how can you gather evidence about them? Well, we do have very, very good trend data. Now, trend data, of course, is problematic in that it is always, we are always subject to the utterly unforeseen what the futurists call the wild cards, of which COVID-19 is a perfect example. The wild card comes and strikes, so would an asteroid or um, a nuclear accident of immense proportions. But we do have good evidence about the way in which trends are moving if there are no other interventions. And it's those that I'm going to concentrate in the next 10 minutes or so. Stephen Hawking, one of the greatest scientists the world has ever seen, just before he died, wrote a book called Big Answers to the Big Questions. And he remarked that he thought our future is a race 
between the growing power of our technology and the wisdom with which we use it. And he hoped before he died that wisdom will win. And I think that education is part of the effort of ensuring that wisdom will win. But for that to happen, we have to transform our institutions very profoundly, I think. Another writer about the future whom I've looked at a good deal is Klaus Schwab, who is the chief executive and founder of the World Economic Forum. He wrote a book on the fourth industrial revolution and he remarked in that, the changes coming are so profound that from the perspective of human history, there has never been a time of greater promise or potential peril. And it's very important that you notice both of them, promise and peril. My concern, however, is that decision makers are too often caught in traditional, linear, non-disruptive thinking, or too absorbed by immediate concerns to think strategically about the forces of disruption and innovation shaping our future. And that concern that he expresses there, I think, is absolutely what we have been seeing in education. Although my hope is that because of the disruption of COVID, decision makers, policy makers, leaders might be starting to think rather differently. I worry that won't happen and that we get quotes back to normal and snap back to old ways of thinking, but we must work, I think, to ensure that doesn't happen. Because the evidence suggests that there are three major tipping points or pivots, or if you like inflection points that will distinguish humanity in the 21st century. And I've tried to gather the evidence around these um, to make them kind of accessible in ways that make sense. And the three pivot points are around our planet, the apotheosis of technology, and our own evolution as a species. So if I start with the first of those, it would seem that our planet is at a tipping point never see, be seen in human history before. And there are three strands, as it were, which combining together will take us we know not where. And the three strands are the sixth great extinction, our entry into the Anthropocene age, and of course the climate emergency. So taking those in turn, the sixth great extinction Little discussed up until very recently is now one of the prominent perils that face us from many points of view. From a moral standpoint, I would say, what right have we to continue along the path that we are in which we are seeing widespread elimination of the biodiversity of our planet? And if you doubt it, take a look at the UN report from May of last year on biodiversity and ecosystems, in which they said ecosystems, species, wild populations, local varieties and breeds of domesticated plants and animals are shrinking, deteriorating or vanishing. The essential interconnected web of life on earth is getting smaller and increasingly frayed and it's the direct result of human activity. They observed there that it constitutes a direct threat to human well-being. And man, how right they were, because of course, COVID-19 is a zoonotic uh, virus. It has jumped from animals to humans, and it has done so because we are completely out of balance in our natural environment. Our encroachment into wild habitats, the deforestation that is going on, the use of wild animals in wild animal markets in many parts of the world, has led precisely to the jumping of a virus from animals to humans. And it's not gonna be the last by any means. Biologists estimate that there are around 700,000 other viruses out there which could jump at any time. So the answer is not a scramble for another vaccine every time. The answer is to reset our relationship with the natural world. And as you see from the UN report at the bottom there in red, they remark, the current global response is insufficient. Transformative changes are needed. That word again, transformation. Transformative changes are needed to restore and protect nature. And opposition from vested interests can be overcome for the public good. 
Well, I don't think it can be overcome unless we start to educate people very differently and put at the very center, not at the periphery, not at the edges, this issue about the peril in which our planet rests. The second strand is our adventures into the Anthropocene. We have entered a new geological age. I don't have time in this very short talk to talk to say much about it, but our boring many hundreds of centimeters or kilometers into the earth after the search for fossil fuels, um, the acidification of the oceans, human activity is changing the very structure of the planet itself. And of course, there is the rise in surface temperatures. And you all know this audience does not need to be told by me how very urgent it is that we cease, that we cease the rise in those temperatures and start to reverse them. And God help us that with the recent election, perhaps the world will get on track again to have international agreements which address that issue. If they don't, life on our planet will be unsustainable and this existential threat will be realized. I am sorry if I sound apoc you know, apocalyptic or catastrophic. It is because the situation merits no less. So that's one pivot or turning point for our world. The second point of pivot is technology coming into control perhaps. And I think there are three strands here. One is job disruption by robots. The second is the rise of artificial intelligence. And the third is global connectivity. And I wanna start with that last one because this is one of the positive aspects on which we can dwell. Global connectivity, what some writers now called big mind is such that across the world, science and research is absolutely fundamentally instantly interconnected in a way that has never happened before in human history. And again, if you want a perfect example of that, the search for the vaccine for COVID has demonstrated it because research teams across the world have been sharing data, sharing approaches, obviously pursuing their own research pathways, but learning absolutely instantly from what their colleagues across the world are doing. So this creation of big mind across our globe is an incredible opportunity and a complete shift from the history that humanity has shared previously. Growth of artificial intelligence, this data only goes up to 2015. I'm sorry that the Y axis is a little unclear. This is the number of patents um, that were filed in that time sourced from the OECD. And you can see the growth of those up until 2015 and that growth has only accelerated in the meantime. But of course, all of this is bringing about a disruption such as we have never seen before. And that disruption will only have been accelerated by the COVID-19 virus. Um, you will have seen many popularized books like this one from Federico Pistono saying robots will steal your job, but that's okay. Um, you won't feel quite so okay if you're on the receiving end of it. And here is the last data I could find back in 2019. I'm sorry about the poor quality of this slide, it's a bit fuzzy, but shows the percentage of existing jobs at potential risk of automation. And the brown, fairly straight upward tra trajectory there is all sectors. So you can see that by the mid 2030s, this PwC estimate was suggesting that about 30% of all jobs will be, have been impacted. Now this was before COVID-19. And we know that at periods such as this, employers, all kinds of companies are rapidly automating, partly because they now can and they've needed to, but also because it's a way of driving down costs. So if anything, the speed of this impact and disruption is going to have been accelerated by COVID-19. The third pivot or inflection point in human history, utterly unprecedented, is the way in which we as a species are acting upon our own evolution. And that maybe that there are some biologists on the call today, and I'd be very interested in your comments, but from the literature and the research, I discern three strands or, or, or elements of this shift that are entwining together, leading we know not where. The first is around genetic engineering. The second is around the convergence of human bodies with artificial intelligence. And the third is human enhancement technologies. 
HETs. If I start with the third of those, of course, they are not heritable. They will not be affecting our uh, evolution. But human enhancement technologies do affect the, the nature of us as humans, I think. I mean, many of the people on this call will have been enhanced. You might have had a transplant or a pacemaker, certainly new knees and hips, loads of them. Almost every element, every organ of the human body is now replaceable, capable of being replaced. I mean, <clears throat> retina, uh, um, re lens replacements in the eye is so common now. So the human enhancement technologies are impacting on our bodies in real time in enormous numbers of ways. But of course, the convergence of human bodies with artificial intelligence, the point at which we move away from holding our phones close to our body the whole time and having it implanted is not very far away at all. And when our brains are permanently connected to the internet, what does that make us? Genetic engineering though, is the one I think that for me makes the back of the, my, my, the, head, the hairs on the back of my neck sort of stand up because I can hardly get my mind around this. We are now entering the point where it is possible to select the traits that we want babies to inherit. And though we are a long way from choosing the designs that parents absolutely want, the research is well underway in which it is possible to design out certain genes and design in others. And where will that be leading us? We have come to the point, I believe, where we are actually impacting upon our own evolution as a species. Okay, so three pivot points around the planet, around technology, and around our own evolution as a species. I call that a transforming world. And whilst it's not in everyone's face straight away, these are things which are going to impact our future in a huge way and an important fashion. So I repeat, I would want to argue that our explicit purpose should be about learning to thrive in that world, that transforming world. And so we now move to ask ourselves, what will it mean to thrive? What is your idea of thriving in these circumstances? Well, I want to argue that we need to thrive at four levels, at the planetary, at the societal level, at the interpersonal level, and the intrapersonal level. And all four levels are critical. All are deeply interconnected. In many ways, we can't have one without the other. So at the planetary or the global level, I would want to argue that we need new learning goals in order to thrive at the planetary and global level, right at the center of our education systems. That our young people through their education need to understand and believe in what it means to live sustainably and to protect the Earth's ecosystem. Because if they don't, we are toast, we are done for. And this is not a kind of nice to have within a geography lesson or a, a biology lesson. It has to be absolutely the heart of the values and the attitudes that young people uh, start to acquire. And amongst those two is the acquisition of global competence. The recogn and I, I use here the definition of the, that the OECD uses in terms of global component competence, which is around understanding and knowledge and respect for other cultures and uh, other nations, because otherwise we cannot become a peaceful planet. So I think there are three new learning goals there, which need to be absolutely the center of learning if we are to thrive at the planetary and the global level. There is no planet B. And fortunately, young people are getting to understand that in a visceral way. Before COVID, of course, we saw some of the biggest strikes we've ever seen across colleges and in schools to change what we are doing within schools and make it real. And it wasn't just in the rich global north, because in many ways, the global south is experiencing the impact of the climate emergency much more directly. The next level then is at the societal level. And I want to argue here that there are two goals that we need to acquire or, or take up to be at the very center of our narrative for education. The first is to navigate a disrupted and uncertain landscape of work. And the second is to reinvent 
our participative, authentic, and meaningful democracy. I'm going to start with the second of those, the one about democracy to begin with. And if you think I'm just being political here, I'm actually not. I am certainly being true to my values, but what I'm wanting to do is to argue from what it is that makes a thriving society. And it turns out that we know some stuff about that. Many of you will know this book by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett called The Spirit Level. And in it, they look at why equality is better for everyone. They take data from across a whole number of countries and those data are things that are unarguable about thriving. They include levels of suicide, levels of homelessness, level, levels of illiteracy, levels of employment, things that really aren't ideological. You couldn't, you couldn't de debate whether or not they are markers of a, a thriving society. And what they show is that if you aggregate those markers, the most thriving societies are not the richest. The most thriving societies are the ones which are most equal. And that's why equality is better for everyone. And if you believe that, if you accept that argument, then what is it that brings about equality? Well, I don't know of any better route than democracy. And God knows it's under enough attack at the moment. But the alternatives, in my view, are worse. But it seems to me that we have entered an age of democratic disappointment, that people no longer trust democracy to address some of the issues which are fundamental to their lives. And of course, I don't need to labor the point of how that has manifested in recent elections. And the, the bookshelves are crowded now with books about the fragility of democracy and how it is at risk. Here are two, but there are very many more. Um, in a recent article in The Economist, they made the point that democracies are generally thought to die at the barrel of a gun in coups and revolutions, but these days they're more likely to be strangled slowly in the name of the people. So that's why I say that at the societal level, one goal should be to, to reinvent a participative, authentic and meaningful democracy. And that surely has to start in schools, not by teaching about our civic institutions, but by enabling young people to think and to act in ways that help them to understand what democracy is really about. It's about more than voting. It's about a free press. It's about freedom of expression. It's about the independence of the judiciary. It's about the respect for the rights of minorities. It's about many things. But unless young people get to be a point where they are prepared to fight for democracy, we will not see the equality in societies coming, which is the bedrock of thriving. And the second point I make there is the need to navigate a disrupted and uncertain landscape of work. Because as I already argued, if, it's, if we know one thing, it is gonna be disrupted. And there's plenty of arguments about this. You will all know these data, I suppose, that from the shift into the 21st century, we won't have one path, but many, many, and several careers, not just in one area. Um, that's familiar. But we're now also seeing this is data from um, the users of Upwork and Freelancer, sites to help people who are self-employed find employment. I'm sorry about the y-axis, it says millions of users. And you could say, well, this is freeing up work, or is it more about reducing worker security? No longer can workers look to a single company or a series of company to, companies to rely upon to make sure that their professional learning is updated, to make sure that they have a pension in due course. Many more people are having to do that for themselves and worker security is very much reduced. Nor are the professions a safe haven. So if you don't know the work of Richard and Daniel Suskind, I really recommend them to you. And in that they explore how technology will transform, that word again, the work of human experts and the impact of technology on professions. So, all of these areas are going to be disrupted. And the goal for education in schools particularly then needs to be to enable young people to navigate this new world with a degree of confidence and understanding. And of course, all of this has been accelerated by globalization, robotics, and indeed by the nature of this pandemic itself. 
There are those who argue that we need to focus on what it is that humans can do that robots can't. And quite often, two things come up, creativity and collaboration. And the last time I was going through an airport, which happened to be Singapore, I was going up an escalator and I saw this advert and took a quick photograph of it because it made me laugh out loud. Let's write the future with robots that have what it takes to collaborate. So do we think then that collaboration is unique to humans? It's gonna be very difficult, I think, in the future to decide what it is that's utterly exceptional about humans. And therefore we have to be really smart in thinking about how we enable young people to navigate their way through that. Two more levels to go then. I think we need a new set of goals <clears throat> around how we thrive interpersonally. And I think they're around two things. One is enabling young people to learn how to create loving and respectful relationships in diverse and technologized societies. And the second goal is to engage with and learn from other generations. I'll deal with that last one first because I'll be very quick. The, if you look at the graph, and I'll, I'll do it very quickly there, the world's population of centenarians is about to grow eightfold. We are becoming a much older species. And what is the prospect that our older, the seniors, will be kind of warehoused out of the way, uh, just, just kept quiet, perhaps by robotic care assistants or AI-enabled pets? Or can we create circumstances in which the wisdom and the knowledge of the older people is actually becomes a part of our learning fabric. But where I want to go really to begin with is around this whole issue of her learning how to create loving and respectful relationships in diverse technologized societies. And I come back to this issue about technology again, because many people would say that increasingly young people are today's Mowgli's. I don't know if you know Mowgli from the Jungle Book who was brought up in the forest by wild animals. And today's Mowgli's are being brought up by screens. And young people have a more direct and powerful relationship with their screen than they do with humans. And there are psychologists who would argue that the casualty of all of that is empathy. And that empathy is absolutely at the heart of great relationships. And how do we teach empathy in school? How do we make connections? One of the things that I hope we do when we get back to face-to-face -to -face learning, really, is to concentrate on this issue, sometimes called social and emotional learning, but the, the, the fostering of empathy for me is an absolutely fundamental issue. And loving relationships too, in circumstances where even sex is becoming in, completely embroiled in technology, meet harmony. Harmony is a sex robot, not a, not a doll, a sex robot powered by artificial intelligence being manufactured on the West Coast and doing very well at the moment. I should think COVID-19 has sent sales going through the roof because she will learn you. She will find out which books you like to read, the kind of music you like to listen to. Her skin is perfect, as you can see, it's silicon. Um, and she can really move. And of course, she never says no. So I invite you to think what you feel about a society where sex robots become an increasing element in terms of our relationships and what that might mean for the development of empathy. So finally, the final trans frontier, or should it have been the first frontier? What will it be to thrive intra-personally as a, as a single human? And I think we need to have two goals at the heart of this. The first is fostering a secure sense of self, enabling young people to find their purpose, to know who they are, to be quiet in a noisy world. It's a noisy world because soon we will never be offline. And of course, through the pandemic, it has been a lifeline. These Zoom conferences, these Zoom connections with our loved ones have been absolutely critical. And there are data, this is data coming out of the PISA results for OECD, showing that on average, the OECD average, and this was before COVID, suggested that over 60% of young people, 15 year olds, felt really bad if they were disconnected from the internet. 
Well, I can only imagine that that has soared now. But my point here is that it creates a kind of a noise in the head, a kind of desire constantly be to, to be connected and cutting you off perhaps from the, the value of silence, the value of listening to your own small voice and finding out who you really are. So I really welcome the introduction of the techniques of mindfulness, of thoughtful reflection that are growing in schools because these are techniques which are learnable and which are fundamentally important. And in my view, it is far more important that we enable young people to become mindful than we enable them to have their minds full, their minds jammed with noise and stuff and facts. Rather, mindfulness should be our real goal, I think. So those are my four learning goals or sets of goals across thriving at four different levels. And in the book, I make a much longer argument about how they are starting to be realized in many schools across the world, thank God. This is not just a theoretical argument. To take that final one, intrapersonal and a secure sense of self, the social and emotional learning that's going on in many schools now is absolutely fantastic. That needs to be at the heart and not just a nice to have on the periphery. And it needs to be in every single school and college. This is an argument we can win now because we have got multiple examples of what this looks like in practice. But I believe that we need to create a new narrative around purpose to make it really count. So in finishing, I wanna say, I think there is hope. We have learned through COVID that unthinkable ideas can move to the mainstream. If you had told certainly the government in this country where I am in the UK, that they would directly be meeting the wages of eight or nine million people, you'd have been laughed out of the room. And that's exactly what's happening now. Unthinkable ideas can move to the mainstream. And we've learned that governments, well, well-led governments can act decisively to change behaviors and attitudes for the common good. It can happen. And finally, I think I put hope in the fact that redesigning schooling is going on across the world, but it has to be on the top of our post-COVID agenda and not just an afterthought. So those are my reflections around transformation. I thank you very much indeed for listening to me. I very much welcome your questions or your comments. And I'm going to hand over now, I think, to our administrators to help curate that um, so that we can have you brought into the conversation. Thank you.